Welcome to Soul Food, a ministry of Calvary Chapel, Princeton, West Virginia. Whether apostasy stinks often depends on how it is pitched. In the 1930s, a horse liniment named Absorbine was plummeting in sales. An advertising man named Obi Winters had the liniment lab tested, and they found out that it would also work on ringworm of the foot. With a stroke of genius, however, Winters conjured a whole new name for such ringworm. He instead called it athlete's foot. There's such a difference in the way that a malady is marketed. I mean, who would want to admit having ringworm, even if there were a cure? But athlete's foot? One would almost be disappointed if one didn't suffer from it periodically. I mean, it carries such positive associations. This morning, we're going to see that was tragically Jeroboam's genius. Linking his new cult with parts of Judaism seems to have cast a mantle of legitimacy over his innovation. It was not apostasy, but diversity. It was not novel, but it was historical. It had roots and precedents. So much depends on how things are marketed. Now, of course, false religion majors in such subtlety. It will use terms like redemptive, reconciling, and atoning for their positive emotional value, but without their proper, their proper biblical content. For example, Mormons won't approach you claiming that Jesus was born from sexual relations between God and Mary, or that Jesus is Lucifer's spirit brother, or that Jesus himself celebrated his own marriages to both Marys and to Martha. No, instead, they will, use, they will run cute commercials urging fathers to spend requisite time with their families. You see, false religion always wants to appear both congenial and justifiable. Welcome back to 1 Kings. Last week, we ended with Adoram being stoned to death and Rehoboam running for his life. We pick up in verse 20. And it came about. When all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent word and called him to the assembly and made him king over all of Israel. None except the tribe of Judah alone followed the house of David. Now when Rehoboam had come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen warriors, to fight against the house of Israel to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Tell Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and the rest of the people, saying, This is what the Lord says. You shall not go up, nor fight against your relatives, the sons of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing has come from me. So they listened to the word of the Lord and returned to go their way in accordance with the word of the Lord. Well, now that the majority of Israel is following Jeroboam, Rehoboam decides it is time to assemble the troops and fight. It says he was able to garner 180,000 warriors. And speaking of 180,000, do you want to hear something interesting? Back in chapter 5, we are told that Solomon conscripted 30,000 forced laborers 70,000 porters, and 80,000 stonemasons. If you add all that up, you get 180,000. What does that mean? Nothing other than what Solomon employed to build, Rehoboam is engaging for war. I guess it would also be useful knowledge if you're ever on Jeopardy, and the category is Old Testament coincidences. You can feel free to share your winnings with me. So back in Jerusalem, Rehoboam, still operating in knee-jerk mode, now reinstitutes the draft. And he calls up the troops to fight with the house of Israel to bring back the kingdom to Rehoboam, son of Solomon. 
he feels forced to use force. However, the word of God comes to put a stop to Rehoboam's words and plans with a word coming through the prophet. Speaking with divine authority, Shemaiah told the southern tribes that they should not go to war against their brothers. The tragedy of this divided kingdom is actually the will of God. This thing was from him. It was his judgment against the people for the sin of Solomon and worshiping other gods. Therefore, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin shall let the other tribes go. And instead of going to war, they should all just go back home. Now, this is also perhaps a proper point of counsel to us this morning. What do I mean? There are some times in our lives when we should just accept our difficult circumstances and resign ourselves to the hard providences that the Lord will sometime impose upon us. Now, this is not a popular word to contemporary men and women, at least in the U.S. For some reason, we think there must be some way to fix everything and a band-aid for every dilemma. But thoughtful believers know that sometimes their choices, their folly, their bullheadedness, or their hard-heartedness have landed them in a network of circumstances they simply cannot undo. Their lives are riddled with gaping cracks that cannot be caulked, or with irreversible consequences that just can't be righted. What can one do but listen to the word of God at that point and go on living in the kingdom as grace enables us to do so? Now, is that mere weakness or is that just finally wisdom? Something to think about. Remarkably, Rehoboam and his men did not fight against the will of God, but instead listened to the word of the Lord. I find this response mildly amazing. It was Rehoboam's first wise move in the entire chapter. God intervenes with his word to further cut off Rehoboam's folly. That is clearly a footprint of grace. It is also a mighty testimony to the power of God's word spoken by God's prophet. Though desperate for revenge, Rehoboam and his entire army submitted to the will of God. As Charles Spurgeon said on his sermon on this verse, he says, Here's one Shemaiah. Some of you have never heard of him before. Perhaps you will never hear of him again. He appears once in history and then vanishes. He comes and he goes. But only fancy this one man constraining to peace, 180,000 chosen men, warriors ready to fight against the house of Israel by giving to them in very plain and unpolished words the simple command of God. That teaches us that the word of God has the power to change human history. It also has the power to change a man's life, even a man who has chosen to live for himself rather than to serve the kingdom of God. Given everything that has happened in this chapter so far, we would hardly expect Rehoboam to do what God has said. Yet when a man of God told him not to go to war, he listened and he obeyed. The surprise ending to Rehoboam's story is a reminder that God also does not give up on us, even when we choose to go our own way in life. We always have an opportunity to hear and obey what God says. Even after all the foolish mistakes we have made, we may yet find wisdom. God is still speaking to us through the scriptures and calling us to follow Christ as our King. He's inviting us to make the right choice in life and to continue making the right choices. Verse 25. 
Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And he went out from there and he built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom of David will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Shechem was the capital of the northern kingdom. Jeroboam wanted this city to replace Jerusalem in the hearts of the people. Now, in the past, God's people has always gone up to worship in Jerusalem, the place of pilgrimage. This worried King Jeroboam because he thought it would weaken people's allegiance to the northern kingdom. And he knew that if he wanted to capture their hearts, he had to also control their worship. Now, Jeroboam is making a terrible blunder here. Oh no, he said. If my people go down to Jerusalem to sacrifice there, their heart is going to turn towards Judah and Rehoboam. So Jeroboam was terrified at this point. The thing is, at this point, Jeroboam could have recalled God's word back to him in chapter 11, verse 38, which reads, This is the Lord speaking. And if you will listen to all that I command you, and will walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes by keeping my statutes and my commandments. Here's the promise. As David my servant did, I will be with you and I will build you a sure house as I built for David. And get this, I will give Israel to you. So he had God's promise. He could have listened, been careful to do what is right in God's eyes, and trusted God to build for him a sure house and give Israel to him. In other words, he could have just trusted God for his security. Instead, he said in his heart, verse 26 says, Notice, Jeroboam didn't talk to the Lord. He talked to himself. I find that whenever I talk to myself instead of the Lord... I often get mixed up. And the same thing is going to happen to Jeroboam. In this respect, Jeroboam sounds a lot like the young nurse that Robert Bella quoted in his book, The Habits of the Heart. Her name was Sheila. And here's how she described her religion to him. She said, I believe in God, but I'm not a religious fanatic. I can't even remember the last time I went to church. But my faith has carried me a long way. It's Sheilaism. It's just my own little voice. My friends, the trouble with listening to our own little voice is that our sinful hearts desires to lead us into sin. John Calvin aptly described the human heart as a perpetual factory of idols. And so if we listen to our hearts rather than the word of God, we will end up worshiping anything and everything except the one true God, which is exactly what happened to Jeroboam. Now this can be a temptation for everybody in this room. You see, God has promised to supply us all of our needs, but when finances get tight, it can be tempting to start worrying about what we need. God has promised to accept us simply for trusting in what Jesus did for us in his life, death, and resurrection. But it can still be tempting for us to think there is something more that we have to do before God will really be pleased with us. So the question before us this morning is, will we take God at his word or will we keep struggling anxiously for what he has already promised to give us? So Jeroboam here then turns away from orthodoxy, not because it's no longer true, but because it's no longer useful. He did not find it false, but fearful. You see his thinking then. He must hold on to his kingdom. And since he cannot simply trust God's word for that, he must make himself secure. 
And that is the stimulus here for the false religion we're going to see. You see, if you cannot trust God, you will use religion. And in Jeroboam's case, what mattered was not truth, but position. His position. Now, politicians, of course, are especially adept at using religion as long as it serves them. Yet I must confess to you this morning, Jeroboam is not alone in this, in his guilt. Now, I haven't the authority to use religion as blatantly as he did. Yet sometimes I share in his sin, and that sometimes security can be my God. I am frequently quite happy to be a disciple of Jeroboam, walking by logic and not faith, and by calculation instead of commitment. Why? Because some news just seems too good to be true. In fact, that is what many people have against the gospel of salvation. It just seems too good to be true. That everything we need to be right with God has already been done through the saving death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And that all we need to do is simply trust in him. We think, no, surely we need to earn a little bit of that on our own. And so we try to take salvation into our own hands. And we try to do it ourselves or at least help the Lord a little bit. But the good news of God's grace is that salvation comes to us as God's free gift. So all we need to do this morning is simply just trust in that promise. Look at verse 28 with me. So the king consulted and he made two golden calves. And he said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel and the other he put up in Dan. Now, this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. And he made houses on high places and appointed priests from all the people who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam also instituted a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like the feast that is in Judah, and he went up to the altar. So he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he had made, and he stationed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he has made. Then he went up to the altar which he had made in Bethel on the fifteenth day in the eighth month, the month that he had devised in his own heart, and he instituted a feast for the sons of Israel and went up to the altar to burn incense. At this point, anyone familiar at all with the history of the people of Israel will gasp. He did what? He did what Aaron had disastrously done a long time earlier after the Lord had brought the Israelites out of the Egyptian bondage. In fact, he doubled down on what Aaron had done. Aaron just made one bull calf of gold. Jeroboam made two. What was Jeroboam thinking? Well, I suspect he wasn't thinking very clearly at all. He had a practical problem, and so he had to come up with a, a strategy to deal with it. The problem was too great to let something like obedience to the Lord stand in the way. So he tells them, look, it's just too much for you to go all the way up to Jerusalem. Now, going up to Jerusalem was to go up to the house of the Lord, to the place of which the Lord had said, my name will be there. And this obedience to God was always meant to be a joyful blessing. So Jeroboam's first lie was to present this privilege as a burden from which he would bring relief by saying, you guys have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. This way, my way, worshiping the Lord could not be any more convenient and sadly, they were more than willing to believe him. By royal decree, he instituted a do-it-yourself religion. And as in the book of Judges, every person did what was right in their own eyes. 
Now, another lie was to pretend that the new way in which he was inviting the people to see God, which would not require them to go to Jerusalem, had all the real power of Israel's true faith. Notice he says of the two calves, these are those who brought you out of the land of Egypt. In other words, you can enjoy your redemption while reinventing your Redeemer. Once again, beware of anyone who links forgiveness and salvation with their own ideas about God. A domesticated Savior remade for our convenience hasn't the power to deliver us from sin and death. Only the Lord Jesus Christ, as we meet him in the scripture, has the power and the ability to do that. Now, worshiping these idols may seem very primitive to us, but the heart of Jeroboam's sin, honey, that's still with us. Today, we are often told that there is more than one God, or we can even worship Jesus Christ through more than just one religion. Now, we may not claim to worship any golden cows, yet how many of us can spend hours basking in the warm glow of the phone, computer terminal, or television screen, which constantly tells us to love the world, and rarely, if ever, tells us to love Jesus or serve the kingdom of God. I can be guilty of that. But listen to me. Here's the thing. Idols can never satisfy our souls. And yet we are still tempted to think, as long as I get that thing or that person, then I will have arrived and I can handle anything else that life throws at me. The problem is, is that unlike the gospel, idols nurture an insatiable itch. And the more we scratch, the more that itch is going to spread. It's like having poison ivy of the soul. Pursuing the idol causes the idol to keep moving just a little bit further out of our reach. And in that rare instance, where we do in fact attain the idol that we have longed for, we will be astonished at how empty and hollow it really is. All this world's fraudulent pseudo-justifications are shiny on the outside, but they only bring misery when they are finally attained. They are like baited fish hooks. When bit down upon, they only bring pain. So our current Western culture may not be enamored with gold bulls, but it is deeply in love with religious subjectivism. What is it? It's Sheila-ism. It's just my, just my own little voice. But it's really just bootleg religion. So beware of anyone who invites you to see the Lord in a more convenient, less demanding way, or to come to God in some way other than the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter how attractive those words may sound, such a mes message is always a lie. Of his two golden bulls, we were told that he put one up in Bethel and the other in Dan. Now we see why he made two golden bulls. In order to provide a more convenient religion than the one involving going all the way up to Jerusalem, he needed to provide places for the people so that they would be just much easier to reach. But his goal was really to just divert the people from Jerusalem. The two locations were intended to appeal to the people's desire for convenience and accessibility. Bethel was no doubt chosen, at least in part, because of the strategic location for Jeroboam's purpose. It was just 11 miles north of Jerusalem, and it was close to the boundary between the two kingdoms. So anyone considering going up to Jerusalem would likely pass by Bethel on their way. And who would not be glad to cut 22 miles off of the round trip? Now Dan was located at the other opposite end of Jeroboam's kingdom in the far north. 
And it provided a location that was much more convenient for those people who lived furthest from Jerusalem. Once again, tragically, Jeroboam's plan worked. That is, he accomplished the purpose of keeping the people from going up to Jerusalem. They obeyed their king and instead went to Bethel and Dan. It was much more comfortable for the people and it was much more convenient for Jeroboam. The point is, the Bible says, is, is that this thing became a sin. While it may have been a, begun as a strategy to secure this kingdom from what his heart feared, became a sin. Why? Because Jeroboam did not trust God. He did not think that he would be safe if he and his people did what was right in God's eyes. Now, this catalog of the people's sin is going to recur over and over again in the book of 1 Kings. Here they involve participation in the idolatry and the immorality of the Canaanite religions around them. Jeroboam introduced a blended worship of God into Israel, and so now Judah is involved in paganism. Now, this, of course, did not go unnoticed by the Lord. These were the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. And so if a righteous God drove out the pagans for these sins, how could he tolerate such sin among his own people? The original readers of these words in 1 Kings would hear in these words an explanation of why they were at that time now in exile in Babylon. Now we need to hear them as ominous reminders of the holiness of God, who will not let people defile his holy name. In verse 31, Jeroboam changed the personnel of worship by appointing priests from all sorts of people, even though they were not Levites. Now we know from the days of Moses that when the tabernacle had been built, the tribe of Levi was designated as having that particular responsibility. As I've, said to be, as I've said before, to be a priest, you had to have Levi genes. I'm going to work that in every time I can. And strictly speaking, it was only one branch of the descendants of Levi, namely the descendants of Aaron, who were to be the priest. Levites, other than the sons of Aaron, served the priests in various other ways. But did you know that in 2 Chronicles, it indicates that Jeroboam specifically excluded all the Levites? This, again, was a defiance of the law of God. Now, Jeroboam's next innovation was a change in the calendar of worship. He instituted a festival in the eighth month, it says, a month of his own choosing. This involved moving the Feast of Tabernacles from its divinely intended location in the seventh month. Now this change seems to be for no other reason than to make Jeroboam's religion distinctive from the other one. And to cap it all off, he offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. This is probably at the feast we just mentioned. So we see that he celebrates at the wrong time and in the wrong place and on the wrong altar and in honor of the wrong gods. Other than that, though, he was completely orthodox. <laughs> what Jeroboam did was to take the advantage of the tendency of the Jewish people to turn to idols and the desire of most people for a religion that is convenient, not too costly, but close enough to the authorized faith to be comfortable for our conscience. We live in a day when manufactured religion is popular, approved, and accepted. The blind leaders of the blind assert that we live in a pluralistic society and that nobody has the right to claim that only one revelation is true and only one way of salvation will be accepted by God. 
self-appointed prophets and ministers put together their own theology and then they try to pass it off as truth. They aren't the least bit interested in what the scripture has to say. Instead, they just substitute their own ideas. So to finish up today, simply put, Jeroboam did things his way instead of God's way. He even claimed the prerogatives of the priesthood, presiding as a priest over Israel and making ungodly sacrifices on an unholy altar. And by the time that he was done, there was hardly any biblical regulation for worship that Jeroboam didn't violate. That is what happens when we follow our own hearts instead of the word of God. We will do whatever we please instead of doing what pleases the Lord. As the Bible describes what he did, it repeatedly uses the Hebrew word made. As in Jeroboam made this, and then he made that. And by the time he was finished, he had a man-made religion. Jeroboam went on to assign holy days and appoint priests as an attempt to hold on to this little kingdom that he had built. May Jeroboam's sin be a warning to us this morning. For how many concessions are we willing to make in an attempt to hold our own little kingdom or agenda together? What problems are you facing today? Let's don't be like Jeroboam. Let's not talk to ourselves. Let's talk instead of the Lord and seek his kingdom and not our own way. Let us pray. Lord, I admit in front of these people that I have turned from idols from time to time. I've tried to put them in that place that only you can occupy. And every single time they have first mocked me and then failed me. But you have always drawn me back as the true and living God. As it says in 1 Timothy 6, 19, you offer us life that is truly life. So let us this day cast away our idols and turn wholly back to you for you are our God. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. This being the